Zhou Yue, Wang Mengmeng, good to see you both. The world's attention swinging toward Beijing for the next several days to see what the future holds for one of the world's largest economies. And joining me live from here in Washington is Cheng Li. He's the director of the John L. Thornton China Center and a senior fellow in the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution. So this two sessions comes at a very key time. China appears to be emerging from the pandemic. And we'll hear about the 14th five-year plan so a blueprint for the years ahead, and it is also the 100th anniversary, the founding of the People's Republic of China. So what do you expect we'll learn? Well, the expectations are very clear that the meetings will prove the two separate blueprints. One is, you just mentioned, the 14th five-year plan. This is from this year to 2025. Uh, use a number, we can see that the, uh, the per capita GDP is expected to increase from uh, 10,000 US dollars uh, now to uh, 12,000 dollars in 2025. But the second one is even longer term. It's a 20 it's called the 2035 vision from uh, 2021 to 2035. Uh, so basically, the G, uh, GDP per, uh, per capita will increase to 30,000 uh, dollars. This is really remarkable. This is three times China's current level and also China's middle class, the number of China's middle class will uh, increase from 4,000, I mean, 400 million now to about 600 million. So this is a really re remarkable development, for, not only for Chinese economy, but also have very strong impact for China's position in the world. And that being said, what are people, China watchers outside the country looking for? What are the most important issues? And you think the biggest takeaway in the days ahead, what will they be looking for? Well, I mean, Chinese already set the themes, uh, talk about the, the uh, uh, replacing high-speed growth with high-quality growth, talk about balancing its economy with the supply-side structure reform, which is still uh, have a lot of barriers to overcome, and also expanding domestic demand uh, while continuing to support the international export markets. Now, the outside world particularly will, will see what that means by the so-called dual circulation, and also the driving uh, the modernization through innovation and technology advancement. This is very, very important because the tech, uh, techno war is still going on uh, between China and the United States, not completely over yet. And finally, that the Chinese leadership will emphasize to promote high-end intelligent and the green uh, production. We want to see how that uh, you know uh, translates into climate change uh, and et cetera. So these are the issues that international community also will look very, very carefully. And, and you mentioned it there, the China-U.S. relationship coming into play, both Beijing and Washington speaking about it within the past 24 hours. Let's listen in to what each side had to say, and I want to get your reaction on the other side. Let's listen. The diversity of human civilization is a basic feature of the world and the source of human progress. Each country's history, culture, and social system has its own merits, and none is superior to another. We believe that countries with different histories, cultures, and social systems should and can coexist peacefully. China and the United States may have disagreements on certain issues. This is only natural. But cutting off supplies or decoupling hurts others without benefiting oneself. Conflict and confrontation serve no one's interests. China is uh, fundamentally uh, a competitor of ours. It is a competitive relationship. It is a relationship that has adversarial elements that we all know about. Uh, it is a relationship that, uh, when it's in our interest, uh, can have uh, cooperative uh, elements. So we see this new administration in the U.S. trying to make its mark and some different, differing characterizations there between uh, those two people. How do you read this and what message is each side trying to send to each other at this moment? Well, I think both sides have a valid point. Certainly, uh, cultural diversity is a value that uh, you know many countries all around the world people believe this is not a superiority for one culture than the other. And uh, so, uh, China is uh, is right that you can emphasize this uh, cultural diversity and uh, inclusiveness and uh, and tolerance. But on the other hand, that the United States has a very point, and certainly the competition uh, defines the U.S.-China relations. Uh, competition is not that bad because that the uh, administration also mentioned that within the competition framework, uh, in certain areas, we need to cooperate from each other, like climate change and etc. So it's still early, though. Um, 
We know that these two countries have to work together when it comes to trade. And you mentioned there is this tech competition. Uh, so we see these issues already being addressed. How do you see ties with China progressing under the Biden administration? Well, I'm hopeful. I think that there's still uh, only uh, uh, you know, a couple of months that uh, uh, since he uh, uh, became uh, the president. I think that uh, uh, you, we, one should not expect that the whole thing will uh, dramatically change. Uh, but on the other hand, we should first of all, we should know the Chinese is really in good uh, uh, position in many ways, because China's economic recovery is remarkable. China's GDP growth last year was 3.5 percent. It's really the best uh, economy, you can, you can say, uh, compared with the major economic powers. And also Chinese economy in uh, last year was 10 times, I'm sorry, 10 10 percent bigger than that of 2019. And also China uh, handled well, uh, despite the early weeks of the coronavirus. Uh, 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 certainly China, uh, in terms of death toll and the uh, infection rate is uh, pretty low. And also it's a relatively maintained social um, you know, uh, political stability. And uh, also the poverty elimination that uh, the Chinese leadership emphasized, particularly Xi Jinping emphasized, certainly have a very positive result. And the, the country can now can claim there's no absolute uh, 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 poverty. So, and also that uh, you see the growing international influence despite some of the, the challenges still China need to face. So Beijing believes that uh, it will take a long time for the U.S. to recover from COVID-19 racial and the political divide, economic structure problems, and the serious domestic economic disparity. Now, also compare with China and United States, you know, China's GDP is expected to surpass the United States in 2028. Uh, in seven years, so two years earlier, because of COVID-19. This is according to uh, the, the economists, uh, not only uh, Chinese economists, but also uh, many IMF and uh, uh, other foreign uh, economists. And also in 2035, this is what Chinese call the 2035 vision, U.S. economy will likely be only 75 percent of Chinese economy. Now, this is uh, uh, the Chinese perspective. But also Chinese certainly understand that uh, there's a lot of restraints and, uh, from Biden administration. And, uh, but uh, you look at the four top agenda, COVID-19, economic recovery, and uh, racial justice or social uh, economic equality, and finally climate change. At least three of them, the number one, number two, and number four, related to China's uh, cooperation. U.S. is in much better position if we uh, cooperate with China, yet whether it be COVID-19 uh, uh, recovery, and whether it be economic recovery, and also will be climate change. China and Chung Lee, we will have to important. leave it there. We are out of time, but all things to look forward to in the coming months ahead. Always great to get your take. Thank you so much for joining us. And that is it from me here in Washington, D.C. Now back to Beijing with more coverage of China's two sessions. Zoe Wei, Meng Meng Meng, back to you.